Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this Daily Maverick uh, webinar. I am Ray Mashaka and I am with the Daily Maverick. Uh, we'll be talking all things Africa this afternoon uh, with Victor Homeyaswana. Uh, Victor wrote an excellent book called Africa Bounces Back. Uh, you can purchase Victor's book uh, directly from the Daily Maverick's shop and all the proceeds from uh, the Daily Maverick shop go towards supporting independent journalism and making our investigations uh, possible. So for those who have supported us uh, up until now, thank you so much. We really appreciate your support. And without you, uh, we, we wouldn't be able to uh, make investigative journalism in South Africa possible. Um, if you want to understand the dynamics of the 50 odd uh, countries in the African continent, uh, Victor is the go-to guy. He is optimistic about the African continent. Uh, in fact, he calls um, himself uh, an Afro-optimist. I'll ask him about that uh, a bit later. But uh, Victor, hello, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon, Ray. It's good to see you, man. And I appreciate that you read the book. You amazed me when you said you read it twice. I, It, it was a labor of love. It was very tough to write it. And I'm shocked that you read a book as thick as this two times in such a short time. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks for the invitation to you and Daily Maverick. Absolutely. Well, it's a testament of how great a book is. You wouldn't read a book twice if it wasn't interesting, I guess, Victor, eh? For sure. It's, it's, I mean, there's so little time and there's Netflix, there is Facebook, there, there are all kinds of things competing for our time. So I'm humbled that you did make that much time available. For one book, is humbling. Indeed, Victor. And to the 169 people joining us, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, please keep asking questions throughout this webinar. Uh, we want this to be as interactive as possible. So please uh, do keep those questions coming. Um, but a bit of housekeeping before we start uh, our discussion with Victor. Uh, sometimes technology can fail us. Uh, we are working from home living at home so you know the internet connection can be terrible uh, disturbing the quality of webinars and discussions um, unfortunately there isn't much we can do and we are trying our utmost best to deliver quality throughout these webinars so uh, we beg for your patience please and if you happen to miss this webinar uh, because of poor internet connection or uh, the time is you know inconvenient for you all of our webinars are recorded and are available on Daily Maverick's YouTube page. Or please visit our website, dailymaverick.co.za. You'll find uh, more information about um, our webinars. But enough preaching from me. Uh, and uh, let me start with, you know, Victor. Uh, you know, in the book, you say you prefer writing or speaking about countries in the African continent that you have visited. And I wonder, out of the 50 odd countries uh, in the continent, how many have you visited so far? 30, three zero. Jeez, that's remarkable. That's remarkable. I'm <laughs> jealous. I'm jealous of Tevi Galafing, who, who contributed a special chapter about African brands. Tevi has been to all 55 of them. So yeah. I, I feel like I know a bit, but compared to him, I'm a novice. Well, 30 is impressive, Victor. I mean, I don't think a lot of people can actually say I've visited, you know, 30 countries in the African continent. I mean, that's it's it's quite remarkable, let's say. Hey, 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 Victor. It is because and 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 here's the reason. Obviously, I traveled mainly for business. I used to work for the professional services firms. I worked for Ernst and Young, I've got to say. we serviced a lot of multinationals. I worked for a cement company which I had to take into Rwanda and into the DRC. So the only way you are going to be able to make a, an informed decision about a country is, is to visit it. I, I respect people like yourselves, the, the, the journalists, the investigative journalists. There's a lot of desktop work that you can do. You can read lots of books, but nothing beats Ray walking the street, talking to the taxi driver, talking to the waiter at the, at, the, at the restaurant, checking into an hotel and asking the, the frontline staff, talking to the bellhop, going for a jog in a foreign city at five in the morning 
and seeing what happens, what the city looks like when it first wakes up. So, yeah. and that's one one of my habits. I I like to jog in the cities I I visit, and and I've had experiences. There are cities that are very easy to jog in, like Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, like Kigali, yeah, and Accra in Ghana. But there are cities that are not so easy to jog in, like Nairobi and and, and Lagos. But I, I have that habit of jogging in cities in the morning at the same time, just to see what it looks like when it wakes up first. Nothing, no, no amount of reading can prepare you for that. Yeah. And before we get into the book, uh, Victor, I'm going to be very selfish um, and, and, and abuse you for a moment. I know you're very close to decision makers yeah. uh, in government and business as well um, across the continent. Um, I wonder, in your engagements with these key decision makers, how do they feel about South Africa and the and the events that have played out um, in the past week? Uh, you know, the looting, the street violence, and uh, the absolute devastation we've seen. Uh, you know, are, are the people you talk to on a daily basis, which are also investors, how do they feel about South Africa at the moment? Very disappointed, almost shocked, and. But the disappointment is something that South Africans have to understand. I, I say as a fellow South, Af as a South African, we have to really not underestimate how seriously the rest of the continent takes our country. It's so important to the continent we don't understand that the things we do or do not do that put us in a bad light are not a disappointment to us only. They're a disappointment to a lot of people. You know, you, you travel on a continent and they will ask you still about Nelson Mandela. In fact, I remember that when Mr. Mandela died, you remember he died at night. Yes. The first five messages that I got on my phone, condolences, oh, we are shocked Madiba died, were from Uganda, Accra in Ghana. They were from the DRC. They were not from South African people. So it's just that when you travel and you, they know about Kaiser Chiefs, they know about Orlando Pirates, they know about, you know, they know so much about Julius Malema. They know, they're watching what's happening because they still look at South Africa as that country is like the youngest member of the family because our independence came last. They look at us as that country that still proves that an African country can reach a solution without bloodshed, although we did, those of us who lived in the 80s and 70s will know there was a lot of bloodshed, but they, they like the fact that we negotiated. They like the fact that we had a world famous statesman who preached forgiveness and reconciliation. And the fact that we have Tabo Mbeki who was leading the African Renaissance movement. Yeah. When we hit the skids and started going wayward, they just were so disappointed. Yeah, I, 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 you're right. We've been here before as South Africa. Um, but, but I wonder, is it too premature to draw a conclusion uh, to say that, you know, the, the, the events of last week will lead to a lot of investors being perhaps sceptical about touching South Africa or even coming there um, as well? Is, is that a fair, fair assessment, uh, you know, or, yeah. or, or just exaggerating that? Yeah. If we do not take the necessary actions to correct the situation, and the necessary actions are doing what we should have done in 1994, right? And that was to make our economy inclusive. We have done a lot of things very well, but we have done very poorly in making the economy of South Africa inclusive. The biggest risk to our country is income inequality, and the fact that way too many people have nothing to lose. So as much as I condemn looting, when I looked at the looters last week, the one thing I saw was a lot of young, energetic people who are so angry because the damage they caused was not about looting. It was about destroying a country that they don't feel like they belong to. And the reason I can relate to that is when I grew up as a kid in the 1970s, I always used to look at something on a Coca-Cola can saying, keep South Africa clean. And I would always think, but which South Africa and why should I keep it clean? So let's not underestimate the real reason for what happened last week. There's not Jacob Zuma, that's a red herring. It's because we left way too many people out of the game. And there's nothing more dangerous, more explosive, more destructive 
than someone with nothing to lose. And we have way too many of them in South Africa. Yeah, yeah. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We have about two, more than 200 people uh, joining us. Hello, Deborah. Hello, Dion. Hello, Bianca. Hello, Lynn. And everybody else uh, joining us here. But let's speak to South Africa because you do dedicate a chapter um, in your book um, about South Africa. Um, one of the most crushing things I've discovered from your book is that South Africa is no longer considered as a gateway um, to the rest of the continent, uh, uh, that is. And um, we've always said South Africa is a gateway to the continent. That gives us like a bit of bragging uh, rights, uh, you, know, you know, Victor. Uh, yeah. you know, but, but you say also that, that the, as I said in the, in, in, the, in the chapter, in the book chapter uh, about South Africa, you say the country used to be a gateway into Africa, um, but you do recognize that the judiciary is still solid, the banking system is reliable, infrastructure uh, compares uh, with the best in the world in South Africa. But what and our, we, and our what, financial reporting, yeah, and our financial reporting, because investors take these things seriously. Yeah, they look at them very seriously. But let's let's face it, Ray. Our costs of internet connectivity and mobile data are the highest in Africa. We are poorer than even Somalia. We cost to access the internet in South Africa via mobile phone chat costs more than it does in Somalia. You are not going to do it in this fourth industrial revolution days. Be getting anywhere if the cost of connectivity is so much. You saw it with COVID, how many young people were left out because they couldn't study. They couldn't attend lessons because they don't have connectivity. We have we have lost to countries like Kenya. If you don't believe me, just go and look at how many companies from Silicon Valley have invested or set up shop in Kenya because of how the country has done well in prioritizing internet connectivity. Look at what Nigeria has done. Nigeria has been able to attract billions of dollars in investments to build refineries, oil refineries. Look at what Cote d'Ivoire has been able to do with, with the cocoa, attracting the French multinationals that are building chocolate factories in that country and in Ghana. Look at what's happening in the Northern African region, Morocco, Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, just so much investment that's happening. But if I may be fair, South Africa should never have been the gateway to Africa. If you look at where it is, physically, we were only the gateway as a colonial hangover. We had way too much connection to London. We had way too much connection to Europe and South and North America and Australia. And that was the reason. Otherwise, if you are in Europe and you want to do business with the DRC, why do you need to fly down to Johannesburg, then fly to Kinshasa? Why can't you just build a direct link? So it was a, it was a colonial hangover. I think that we still were the gateway, but I'm not disputing. We can still be the gateway to the Southern African development community. And that's a major region in its own right. More than 300 million people, more than 14 countries. And because of the African continental free trade area, we should be able to get in there and still remain an important economy. I'm not celebrating the fact that we are no longer the gateway, but if you had an airline like South Africa, which 10 years ago was moving more than 6 million passengers, and you had Ethiopian Airlines on the other side that was moving two to three million passengers, and things have changed now, or oh, Artambo International used to be able to move 17 million passengers annually per, per capacity, and now it has been overtaken by Bole International Airport in Ethiopia, which now can move 22 million passengers a year. So while we were doing whatever it is we were doing, I don't know, there were countries out there that were aggressively building themselves, pulling themselves up by the bootstraps, coming from worse situations than we did, that have got their, that have done their homework and they, are, they have overtaken us, I'm afraid to say. Yeah. You know, Victor, I, I, I like solutions-driven dri solutions conversations, you know, mm. how do we fix problems? And uh, in your book, you also propose a few measures in how South Africa can possibly recover, uh, gain its former glory as a gateway, as you've just uh, you know, made us aware that the country has lost its luster as, as, you know, as the gateway to Africa. But you know, some, of the, 
some of the proposals that you put forward in your book is we need to improve access to health care, you know, uh, access to you know, better standards of education, uh, you know, having a stable policy environment and, and having a degree of openness when it comes to the economy. Yep. Now, with respect, Victor, these are not necessarily new, uh, you know, newly proposed measures. These have been repeated ad nauseum, not only by you, but so many other people. But it seems like we're just not getting it right, uh, Victor. Because we are elitist, right? We are an elitist country. We think like the rich. We plan, we behave like the rich people. And we are not. We're not a European country. We are a poor country. We are not even an urbanized country. We are a rural country. The bulk of our people are living in rural areas. So when we plan, we plan for Johannesburg, Cape Town, Durban. We plan for the so-called major centers. But in doing that, we overlook the fact that the real property boom is not happening in the cities. It's happening in places like Buani in Venda. It's happening in, in rural areas where hard roads have been built. But when we plan, we ignore those people. Even in Johannesburg, when we plan, we ignore Soweto, we ignore Alex, and we prioritize Santa. That's scandalous because what you're doing you are showing that the decision makers are doing everything for themselves, not for the majority. And that's where we have a problem. We can't have the majority of the people not believing that the economy is theirs. So when I say access to healthcare, I don't mean access to healthcare for the majority of people who are in on this call, who have medical aid. I'm talking about people who need to go to Carltonville Hospital, who need to go to Charlotte McClague Hospital. You know why I'm mentioning these two hospitals, Ray? Because in the midst of a COVID pandemic, there was fire that set alight those two hospitals in a space of two weeks. And the explanation we got was the worst gobbledygook I ever heard, including the fact that there was PPE, which I don't believe, that burned in those buildings. Now, when you have that kind of an elitist attitude towards the majority of your people, don't be surprised when they loot and they break everything and you say, what's wrong with these people? What's wrong with them is they don't consider themselves part of your family. And don't get me wrong. I'm not justifying looting. I'm saying I understand why it happened with the intensity, with the aggression that it happened. And if we think we have seen the worst, we better think again. Oh, goodness. That is chilling, Victor, I must say. Um, but Enoch agreeing with you. Um, Enoch, he or she says, I fully agree with Victor in saying economic inclusivity is at the core of our problems in South Africa. Um, a few people are rich and the majority are poor. Uh, with a visionary leader like Ramaphosa, uh, we hope a beginning will be done to normalize this undesirable situation. So. Um, a lot of people agreeing with you, uh, Victor, there. But let's get into the book and move away from South Africa, uh, you know, for a moment. Um, as I said, you are an Afro-optimist. Um, you're very uh, optimistic about uh, the African continent um, and its future. Um, the COVID-19 crisis has really exposed the continent's unpreparedness for the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, especially when it comes to the health response. Um, why are you so bullish on the African continent when a lot of people in the developed world are not as bullish as you are? Because, Ray, compared to where we come from, we are still doing a lot better. So, so this is what, 2021. When I wrote the book, I started in 2020, and I, I look back to 1960. And in 1960, which is the country, the year in which lots of African countries gained independence, especially from France and Belgium, including the DRC, I found a man called Patrice Emery Lumumba, who was in office for less than six months as prime minister, democratically elected, but with the help of Belgium and the CIA, was removed from office and he was taken out completely, then assassinated, and his body was chopped and sliced and burned in acid to make sure he disappears from not only the surface of the earth, but from the memory of the Congolese. 
And when he was arrested, he knew he was going to be killed. He wrote a very, very seminal letter to his wife. And in the letter, he says, I don't know if you will be alive when I read, when you re when I'll be alive when you read this letter and when you will read it. But I can tell you that the future of the DRC is beautiful. Okay. And, and he says something even more, more telling. He says, no amount of torture, pain and suffering can force me to beg for mercy because I prefer to die with my head held high than to submit to a wrong system or to sacrifice my principles. Now, if you look at people like that, the Thomas Sankaras who were assassinated, the Amilcar Cabrals, the, the Winnie Mandelas, and you know that we are made of the stock. Hey, man, we made of people who survived slavery, right? Who survived slavery. Now, when I'm optimistic, I'm not just being, I'm saying I'm made of that stock. That's the kind of blood I have flowing in me. Yeah. And Africa has been put through so much. It's been pillaged. It's been robbed. Its minerals have been stolen, including the, the lots of minerals that we see on the crowns of some monarchs in Europe. Yeah. We have lost so much to systematic racism and colonial oppression. And look at us. We're still standing, man. Mm. Uh, Malefi raises, uh, you touched briefly on leadership um, in the African continent. And Malefi, uh, you know, moves us very well into this topic of leadership. Uh, Maliki says, he or she says, how do you move ahead when despots like Museveni cling on to power and no business can move forward when corruption is rampant across the continent? We yeah. see this play out right now in Eswatini. Uh, you know, leaders that are clinging on to power, there's no free or fair elections, yeah. uh, democ democratic structures are not in place. So, so how do we reconcile the good and the bad when it comes to the African continent, especially from a leadership perspective? Because Africans, when pushed hard enough, Ray, will remove those despots. Yeah. You saw it with President Mugabe in Zimbabwe after more than 35 years. You saw it with Omar al-Bashir in Sudan. You saw it with what Emmanuel Eduardo dos Santos in, in Angola. And the people who came after them, most of the leaders who came after, did very well for their countries. I am 50-50 about President Mnangagwa at the moment in Zimbabwe. But if you look at what Joao Lorenzo has done in Angola since replacing Eduardo dos Santos, there's no doubt that whoever is clinging to power knows it's a matter of time. Whether it's Paul Beer in Cameroon, whether it's Yoweri Museveni in, in Uganda, there are many leaders who are clinging to power and are not doing anything for their people. Their day is coming. They know it and everybody knows it. So I can't submit and give up because amidst the very, even in Uganda, even in, in Sudan, I mean, people forget that Mo Ibrahim, Mo Ibrahim, the billionaire yeah. who has produced the Mo Ibrahim Index, is actually Sudanese. I know the Brits like to claim him because he lives in London, but no, sir, he is Sudanese. People like Strive Masiwa, who's a billionaire, dollar billionaire of Africa, the Brits like to claim him as citizen of, he is Zimbabwean. I apologize to, to them because they can't just take the best among us. Even Mo Farah, who is the runner who won long distance gold for, for the UK in the Olympics, he is Somali. So they, they can take the best of us, but we have so many more that will come and find solutions and give us the breakthrough that we need. So when you have that happening and you have young people who are finding so many solutions and you have so many innovations that are taking place and are driven by Africans, why would I be pessimistic? Why? What would I be asking for? What would I be asking God to do for me? Because he will say, I gave you everything. I gave you fellow Africans who are innovators, who are entrepreneurial, who are tenacious. I gave you resources. Now, why would I be, just because a few despots are clinging to power, they are not going to be there forever. Yeah. Actually, Dion uh, reminds us another positive aspect about the continent. Uh, Dion says Africa is predicted to have half a billion youths in 2050. Uh, you know, so, so referring to quite a young population, 
Um, but a population that is increasingly excluded out of being economically active as well. Yes. Um, so, so I think that's something we need to, to fix right there. Hey, Victor? Exactly. And that's the point. And that's why I'm very impatient with any politician who does not do their best to get people and politicians and business leaders, because I shouldn't just look at the government. There are many business leaders who have a lot of power. There are lots of people like us who are commentators who always don't emphasize enough that we have to make sure that we give our youth the right kind of education. The, the private schools aren't going to save us. The, the private hospitals aren't going to save us. We need public education, public health care that is quality, that is world class. And at the moment, because of the elitist stance that we take, we tend to believe, oh, we can take our children to private schools and, and we think everything is hunky-dory. It's not. Those children are going to have to marry kids from the squatter camps. And that's where all the wealth that you would have accumulated can vanish in a day, because then you'll be having people who are not raised from the same side of the track, which is what we saw last week, that people have built empires, including Mike Nkuna, a black investor who built Jablani Mall and, and Protea Mall, and suddenly that investment goes up in flames because people don't quite understand that they are destroying their own. But they don't feel like it's their own if the system that runs their country leaves them out of the game. I'm not really sticking tenaciously to this for now. I'm saying, unless we understand that there's enough on the African continent for all of us and more, we are going to lose the opportunity to capitalize on what we have been given. Yeah, and you talked about innovation earlier on and uh, and using technology to reform economies. Um, a lot of African economies are, you know, are dependent um, on the developed world for their survival and fortunes as well. You see this, especially in countries uh, whose economies depend on highly volatile commodities, uh, you know, and, you know, these, these countries include South Africa, Angola, Nigeria, and so many others. You argue in, in the book that um, it is important for countries in Africa to diversify the economies. Why is this important and how... Where can they start in doing so? Because no country has ever become rich. No country in the world has ever become rich by exporting raw commodities. And there's a chapter in the book where I talk about the history of the UK and why knitwear is such a high-priced export of the UK. When it happened in the, 14th, the 15th century, the monarch banned the export of raw wool and made sure that the wool was processed. South Korea, same thing. They did not develop the Samsungs of this world by exporting raw minerals. So if I, I have a chapter on the DRC called the center of the universe, yeah. where I compare how much in diamond production the DRC is contributing to Antwerp in Belgium, where the diamond exchange is. And I show the numbers that the GDP of the DRC is still less than $60 billion the GDP of the whole country. And in Belgium, there's a city called Antwerp where the diamond exchange is. So a small block where the diamond exchanges are processes so much diamond that its revenue in one year was $54 billion. So you have one block, two, three blocks in a city in Belgium, a country that has no diamond of its own, processing diamonds that are worth $54 billion, a number that's greater than the GDP of Africa's largest producer of diamonds, the DRC. That is an injustice that can never be allowed to continue. So when you take Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, they produce more than 65% of cocoa in the world. More than 65% of cocoa. You know what cocoa beans do? They go into making chocolate. But where are the companies that make chocolate? They are Swiss, they are French, and it's because countries like the US and Europe tax you more if you want to export chocolate into their countries, and they don't tax you at all if you give them raw cocoa. So yeah. it's when Africa realizes that it can never, ever be able to grow by just sending the raw materials out. Because when you do that, you keep the low-income jobs which means you contribute less to your revenue. You export the materials cheaply 
and you import them expensive. And that's why we always worry in Africa about the value of our exchange rate. We want our exchange rate to be anti our currency. We want a weaker rand because we are importing lots of the goods from elsewhere. If we were able to export goods that are worth more, we would want the rent to be stronger. So it's because of that twisted economics that we end up wanting our, our currencies. What, what kind of economy wants its currency to be weak? The currency, the country that exports raw materials and imports processed goods. So when I take this phone here, I show you this phone here, right here. It's a Chinese phone. I could be holding a Samsung, which is a, a South Korean phone. I could be holding an Apple, which is an American phone. None of these three countries have the materials that go into producing this phone right here, yeah. which cobalt is coming from the DRC. The DRC, that's an unstable country. So here I am looking at the DRC and I'm told, oh, it's an unstable country. But I know that America, China, South Korea, are taking cobalt out of that country to make cell phones which they sell to us. This is what, 15, 20,000 rand. How yeah. much is a kilogram of cobalt? Nothing. So you're selling whatever you have for peanuts and you're importing what is made with it for a fortune. Absolutely. I guess that reminds us, uh, Victor, that you know raw materials should actually work in developing local communities. I mean, you cited you know, the cocoa industry, uh, we know there's still a lot of exploitation there where the farmers are paid, you know, fairly. And, uh, you know, so, so that's something to talk about um, as they well. They are paid fairly. They are paid fairly because Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire went on a strike in yeah. 2019 and said, we are not going to export unless you can pay us $400 more per ton of these beans. I mean, of this cocoa. At the time, they literally went on a strike to get the fair price for their farm. Yeah. And while we're talking about reforming economies to make them less dependent on exports and the <laughs> developed world, there's something called the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Um, this is an agreement that is trying to boost intra-Africa trade uh, among the 54 nations um, in, in the continent and creating a single market for goods and services, uh, you know, across across uh, the continent. Um, in your book, you do write about intra-Africa trade still being low. Um, it was around 15%. Uh, 15%, yeah. Yeah, between 2015 and 2017. And the free trade area agreement is expected to boost intra-Africa trade to, to about 52% by next year. Is this a, a game changer in your view? If, okay, if we are going to pray, mm. and I know there are men of God out there, if <laughs> they want to pray for anything, men and women of God, yeah. pray for intra-Africa trade to happen. Because if you look at Asia, they are in the 50s. If you look at Europe, by that I mean Asian countries trading amongst themselves. So intra-Asia trade is in the 50s. The same with Europe. So the rich areas or the fast growing areas that are really changing the quality of life of these of their people have a much higher than 50% intra-regional trade. It doesn't mean you won't trade with the other regions because we're in a global community. But the bigger trade must be amongst ourselves. So imagine that. Imagine this, that the cobalt that's coming out of the DRC, first of all, builds materials and industries that produce the materials that will manufacture these cell phones in the DRC. Yeah. So now we have more jobs. We have more development. Our universities are going to teach manufacturing of cell phones. They, they are going to be able to develop. So we have much more development. And then we are exporting. The DRC now is no longer exporting cobalt. It's exporting products that are made with cobalt. The same with diamond jewelry. We are now not exporting diamonds to other countries. We are manufacturing jewelry here. So we have universities that are teaching jewelry making. We have factories that are manufacturing jewelry. We can do the same with cocoa, chocolate. We can do the same with... Hey, there are so many things that we are exporting that we shouldn't be exporting. So once we do that, 
the jobs get created here, and I'm talking high paying jobs. You pay a lot more for somebody who refines oil than somebody who works in the mine drilling that oil. You pay a lot more to a jewelry maker than you pay for a mine worker or drill, a drill, what is it? The drill operator, rock drill operator. You yeah. saw at Maricana, we didn't want to pay them 12,500 a month. But if you are paying a jewelry maker or you're paying somebody who makes with that platinum that's coming out of Maricana and makes an auto catalytic converter that goes into these cars that we drive, we pay those guys a lot more. And when you export an auto, auto catalytic converter, you bring a lot more hard currency into your economy than when you are exporting platinum as it is. Yeah, but but, but Victor, a point I really want to want to emphasize here is is are the the, the African countries embracing the, the trade agreement? Because yeah. in order for it to work, it does require buy-in from from the member countries. So yes. if they are, you know, are countries embracing? The agreement, because intra-Africa trade, as you point out in the book, is something the founding fathers of the African Union have raised as early as the 1960s. Um, but it hasn't really been embraced since. But is there greater collaboration, greater you know, will to make this work? There is greater collaboration and greater will, but not enough of it. Mm. Because... You know, I saw Emmanuel Macron in South Africa talking to President Ramaphosa, talking about manufacturing some vaccines here. And I said, are these people kidding me? This should have been done already way back because most of these pharmaceuticals are using herbs that they got from Africa. But I don't see enough of it. Just think about it, Ray. In the COVID situation, do you believe that any African country should have imported a mask should have imported gloves, should have imported a, a what do they call it? The, the stuff that they use for, you know, the machines that they use to ventilate. Yeah. You believe we should have imported any, any sanitizer? Yeah. Uh, just, yeah. I'm talking simple things in this very crisis. Did you hear President Ramaphosa talk about aggressively going out to make sure that we manufacture? Remember, we have companies here that can manufacture this protective equipment. So what I'm saying is there's not enough of what we need to do to make sure that we do that. And we don't have to go for challenging. We don't have to say to VW in Germany, we don't want you to sell us VW or Mercedes or, or BMW. We don't have to fight them where they are already established. We can start something where we know we can dominate the game. But I don't hear enough of that. Why? Because we are so obsessed with exotic products so when i see people on tv showcasing their apple or their whatever phones i say but do these people know that there is a factory in kwazulu natal that manufactures mara phones that are smartphones that are african and and when i see government officials brandishing their their smartphones and tablets i say do they realize there's Yekani Technologies in the Eastern Cape, a black woman-owned factory that manufactures tablets? Why is it that I don't see President Ramaphosa with this? Why, why was he moaning about his iPad instead of moaning about something that was made in the Eastern Cape in a company owned by a black woman? Uh, to me, if you talk about will, that's the kind of will I want to see. Yeah, and it's a no-brainer, hey, Victor. It's you know, a no-brainer, and, and that's why it drives me mad. It drives yeah. me mad because it's not something we should be talking about. It's something that anybody who runs a country... By the way, let's not leave out people who run companies. Because yeah. people who run multinationals are part of this problem. They are a big part of this problem. They are the ones who could show their leadership by asking their headquarters in Europe, in Australia, in Germany, and asking for more of the share of the supply chain to be brought onto the African continent. So I'm talking business people, I'm talking politicians. These are the two people that should be jacking up their act a little. Let's bring in people, let's bring in people in this conversation, uh, Victor. Tsapang says um, intra-Africa trade uh, will not work until Africans own the means of production. Um, geez, that's, that's interesting. Um, Hassan uh, Asmal says, uh, invest in machinery uh, retooling uh, and local production uh, 
yeah, basically local production, emphasizing the point about uh, local production as well. And there was a question, uh, Victor, for you. In your view, uh, this is Teliso asks, in your view, what stops us from developing manufacturing capabilities and skills in order to produce finished products instead of having to import? So what, what are the blockages and barriers? Um, the lack of courage. The lack of courage from the politicians is the lack of courage and vision. From the private sector is a lack of loyalty and commitment. That's it. Sure, that's sobering, uh, Victor. Um, Ma Wungo, I'm sorry if I'm you know butchering your your name. Uh, can intra-Africa trade work? Uh, so, can intra-Africa trade without proper, tangible regional integration work? Uh, that's what no. It can no, it happen. can't happen because. If you, if you want to integrate all of Africa, 55 countries, you first have to integrate the 15 countries in the SADC community. So, yes, we have to do it incrementally. And when we say we're making intra-Africa trade, it means South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, Angola. Start doing business with one another. Break down the borders because when you allow people to move across those borders, they will move more money into the countries than you're getting from the visa fees and the, and the customs duties that you are charging, which call for a lot of administration. Whereas if you let people move into the country, they'll go to restaurants, they'll check into hotels, they will pour petrol at your filling station, they'll buy airtime. You know, they just are going to bring a lot more money and they are going to empower the enterprises a lot more than what we are doing at the moment. So regional integration is where it should start. But at least now you know that if you are Nigerian and you want to export to Ethiopia, you shouldn't be stopped. If you are Moroccan and you want to export to Zambia, you shouldn't be stopped. If you are South African, you want to export to Angola, you shouldn't be stopped. And that will help. Because to my fellow South Africans in on in this call, we should start thinking of our market not as 50 million South Africans. We should think of a billion Africans. And, and even if you are selling Coca-Cola cans, just start thinking about selling to more people. If you are making table mats, if you are manufacturing beanies, if you are manufacturing scarves, Start thinking of manufacturing scarves with the Angolan flag, with the Kenyan flag, with the Ethiopian flag, because then you can sell to a whole lot more people than just selling to South Africans. Yeah. And, and Victor, the, the trade agreement goes beyond, you know, trade among countries, but it's also about the movement of people. Movement of people. And allowing them to move freely across the African continent. Yeah. I think it's bizarre that as a South African, I need a visa in order to gain entry into Nigeria, for example. Yeah. Can we see African passports uh, be, becoming a, a, you know, a, a thing of normality the yeah. same way as people in countries that are part of the, the EU can move freely uh, into, into Europe? Yeah, uh, if you have a Schengen visa, if yeah. you have a Schengen visa, you can get into many European Union countries. The reason, yes, I, I agree with you. That's another no-brainer. But remember, we are so religious, Ray, about the borders of African countries as if we made them ourselves. And we didn't. These borders were not created by us. They were created by colonial forces that were just slicing and dicing this Africa amongst themselves. They went to Berlin for two months where have you seen Europeans sit in a meeting for two months? They only do that if they are slicing and dicing a rich continent like Africa. They did that at the Berlin Conference in 1884-85. But some of us are so religious about these borders as if we made them ourselves. Yeah. So when we look at a Nigerian, oh no, we don't want the drug dealer in here. As if we know Nigerians. We don't know Nigerians. We might know a few criminals who are Nigerian nationals, but we don't know Nigerians. You only know Nigerians if you've been to Nigeria, because you'll find the real ones. You don't know Ethiopians, because you've seen a guy selling fabrics in, in, at Park Station. You know Ethiopians if you've been to Ethiopia. So that fear of fellow Africans is the enemy. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to happen until we start just understanding that we are all Africans, 
the suggestion I always make is not to let the borders to go completely, is to allow everybody who has a passport, a valid passport, allow them into your country. Don't ask for a visa, yeah. stamp their passport, find out where they are staying, and make sure you know where to find them. Take their fingerprints in case they get involved in crime and make sure they know that once they are inside South Africa, the police will not ask for a bribe from them. They will arrest them if they break the law, but they will leave them alone if they are not breaking the law. That way you know how many Nigerians, Namibians, Angolans, Kenyans, Ethiopians, Somali are in South Africa. You know where they live, but you don't bother them unless they are breaking the law. They will spend their dollars here. They love to shop in Santon. They love to shop wherever. They will give us the foreign currency that we need and they will go back to their countries. Believe it or not, they want to go back to their countries. They don't want to stay here forever. It sounds, it sounds plausible. It's, it sounds like it's a win-win situation for all countries. That's what they do in Rwanda, just to give an example. Sure. Rwanda is the one country in the world where they say, as long as you have a valid passport, we don't want to waste your time at the entry. We're going to let you in. We're going to let you into Rwanda. We're going to ask you where you are staying. And because the streets of Rwanda are full of people who know one another, if you are Ray Mashaga and you land in Rusizi, they will know there's a stranger in the neighborhood. Yeah. They will watch you. They won't bother you. But the reason is they know who you are. They know you are not from around. They will protect you when you are being attacked, but don't try and break the laws because then they will do something you'll never forget. So I am saying let's strengthen our law enforcement inside the country and make sure that the police are straight up going to arrest only people who are breaking the law. They are not going to harass anybody. They are not going to shake them down for a, crime, for a bribe and then allow everybody to move freely. That way we will be able to promote this intra-Africa trade and especially what you're talking about, yes, the root cause of it being the movement of people. Yeah, listen, there's so much to talk about. Um, I mean, the book is quite thick. We still have to talk about COVID. We still have to talk about Ethiopia. Um, but there's so much to talk about. And remember... Uh, dear viewer who's joining us, you can still buy uh, Victor's book. Uh, there is a link in the comments section above. Just click, click on that link and you can find details on where uh, you can uh, access the book. I want to jump into some of the questions and comments. Uh, why can't we hear more of Victor in the public arena? Um, his views uh, are refreshing and inspiring. So there's a compliment for you, Victor. Thank you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I thought I was loud enough in the public space. Anyway. I, thought you, I thought you were loud enough as well, Victor. <laughs> but Sarah, I would like to ask uh, Victor, what will it take for African countries to uh, resuscitate the Abuja Agreement of 2001 to put 15% of their GDP into building up the health sector. Hmm. There, there are so many. I'm going. I'm gonna say it's not only that Abuja. It's also the Yamasukru Declaration about aviation. There are so many treaties that we have signed on the African continent that we we have to resuscitate. I, that's why I'm saying if we are gonna pray for anything, let's pray for this intra-Africa trade to happen. Because when we start promoting movement of people from one African country to the other, we will know more about one another. And when we know more about one another and we understand one another, we will do business better because we will discover there's nothing to fear. For now, let us stop getting involved in proxy battles for Europe. Because I saw Pan-African Parliament a few weeks ago where the people couldn't even agree because they were playing the Francophone versus Anglophone. And I'm thinking these guys must be really on holiday here because yeah. here is France is playing its own game. Here's the UK playing its own game. It's organized itself into the British Commonwealth and the French Commonwealth, the, the Francophonie. Yeah. And then you have Africans fighting amongst one another about who speaks French and who speaks English. Who cares? It's not your mother tongue. It's not your native African language. Why don't you fight over who speaks Kosa, who speaks 
Zulu, if you have to fight about anything, that's not even a sensible battle to get involved in. But at least we are playing. So I'm saying we must stop playing proxy battles because the reason these treaties don't work, Ray, is that then you have China saying, oh, I want to promote my goods. And if I allow the, too much collaboration, I might not. The same with the US, the same with Europe. So they're using African countries to promote their interests and they, they, they negotiate trade deals with smaller countries. That's easier for them to divide and rule. And because we are not wising up to that, and because we are willing to sell ourselves too cheaply, we allow it to continue. Yeah. By the way, Victor, are, are, are the targets in the Africa Agreement, uh, are they feasible? Are they achievable? Especially when it comes to, you know, uh, increasing intra-Africa trade to about 50 percent by next year no when, mm. that one that one is not feasible purely because of covid 19 and how it has stopped us from moving around it would be feasible though if we were bold because the covid has taught us that hey we can be stopped from going to italy and to england then maybe let's go to nairobi instead let's go to dar es salaam let's go to luanda and if we were that bold, we could actually achieve it. But because we are still, and, and let me not just blame African leaders. Yeah. Remember, we have too many legacies. We have too many hang-ups and hangovers over who spoke French. So France is not playing. France is trying to strengthen its relationship with as many African countries as possible. You see Emmanuel Macron visit Africa. He's not doing it for charity. He's doing it to protect French interests. The same with the UK in the British Commonwealth. So in that understanding, yes, I don't think it's very realistic, but it is achievable in the medium to long term. We just have to be incremental about it. But to do that, we have to know the game that we are playing and why we are losing it. And we are losing it because we continue to be proxy pawns for superpowers and foreigners by, by, by pretending we are actually serving African interests. And a lot of history plays there into those proxy battles, yeah. uh, too. And it's bizarre that we still have divisions based on language as well, which is which is another topic for another day, Victor. Um, but um, Maunga asks uh, a question about accountability. Uh, what can the average African do to get our leaders to honor some of these treaties, uh, trade treaties? How can we hold our leaders accountable? Because the, 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 the population is definitely not apathetic in the continent. Yeah. Well, if you are a trader, eh? if you are a business person, I say get a copy of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreements. Know what you are entitled to. Hey, go to the border and try to move your goods across. And if they say pay this duty, you say no. I know I'm not allowed, supposed to pay that because you should remove these goods from there. I say start drawing business linkages with people in other foreign, in other African countries. That will just force that trade to happen, especially Moongo, because we have the, the e-commerce platforms that we can use. So I would say as an average African, let's start building those bilateral links amongst ourselves. Somebody listening to this in Kenya, let them start saying, hey, can I get this book and sell it in Kenya? because I know I should be able to do that. Once we do that, we are gonna find that we break these boundaries ourselves bottom up rather than wait for somebody to tell us, okay, now you are allowed to move because that is never gonna happen. The implementation started in January. So the, the African free trade area agreement is in force, but yeah. it's gonna happen when we start pushing those barriers ourselves by promoting links among fellow Africans and starting to target markets in other African countries. Mm. Uh, Salma, your question, uh, is the program being recorded? Yes, uh, it is being recorded. Uh, a recording will be available later on the Daily Mavericks YouTube uh, page. Let's talk about COVID, Victor. Uh, we've got about seven minutes left. Yes. Uh, COVID has disrupted every industry in the continent from aviation, arts and culture, you name it, um, it's, been dis it's been impacted by COVID. What are the biggest lessons and takeaways we need, we need to, to take stock uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic? Because the biggest fear for me is that we're gonna go back to normal, the normal ways of doing things. And you know, what's the definition of stupidity? You're doing something over and over again and expect a different outcome, right? So, so what are the biggest COVID lessons we need to take going forward? Oh, the biggest one is that hygiene is important. 
Mm. You know, I went to school in the 70s when hygiene was a school subject, right? Mm. I had to write an exam and pass it. It wasn't just oh, no. a subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had to write hygiene exams and pass exams. And, and, and I mean, if we just had better grasp, a better grasp of hygiene, if we just washed our hands, and I'm talking to men here, because more than 60% of men in Europe admitted in a survey that they didn't wash their hands when they visit the loo. If we grasp hygiene, we would understand. If we had prioritized healthcare systems and made sure that they reach the majority of our people, we would have done better with COVID. If we had prioritized ICT and learned to make working from home an option, so that we don't have to drive to the office. We would have solved not only the traffic problems, we would have been much more prepared when the COVID hit to be able to educate children, to be able to do business, to be able to run meetings, but not feel like we are. And lastly, we have capacity to manufacture things that we should not be importing from elsewhere. Like I've already mentioned the masks and all that. We have no business importing sanitizers. There was a university in, in the Eastern Cape, or was it KZN, in, in Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University, that said they could manufacture sanitizers. I don't know what happened. And I did science at varsity. I know that to manufacture sanitizer is a simple laboratory experiment that even a grade 11 child can do. But we, I don't remember the government saying, oh yeah, let's make sure that all sanitizers are manufactured. So I'm saying those are the lessons that we must take that we can be disrupted anytime. And when it happens, we better be ready. But most of all, let's not waste the crisis. Let's put it to use by building our own industrialization upward. Mm. Prasan asks a very important question uh, before we leave. Uh, one of the stereotypes that exists is that corruption in Africa is worse than in South Africa. Based on your traveling experiences, Victor, is yeah. this still the case? Is corruption worse outside of South Africa than in South Africa? There are some countries that are a lot more corrupt than South Africa. You can read the Transparency International reports every year. But hey, South Africa has as much corruption as any other country. The word corruption is not an, an African word. So mm. corruption is a human phenomenon. In fact, let me just say this. Yeah. Corruption is an equation, is a mathematical equation. On the one side, you have the person paying the bribe. On the other, you have the one who's receiving it. If there's nobody to pay the bribe, there can't be corruption. If there's nobody willing to overlook the law that you're breaking, there cannot be corruption. So. I would just say there are countries that are more corrupt than South Africa. There are countries that are less corrupt. There are companies that are more corrupt than others. And, and there are more human beings that are more prone. The only thing I have to say is when you strengthen institutions, yeah. you you lower the risk of corruption. When you hold people to account in that way, when you catch them in a corrupt, you punish them and you make them pay the price, you lower the corruption and you, you make sure that you, you make it not rewarding. The only problem is we have made it too rewarding to, to people who get corrupt. Mm. And why does Ethiopia excite you, lastly? Because it's a country, to know Ethiopia is to love it. It's much bigger than we think it is. It's 100 million people. It's got higher rainfall figures than we think. It's not a desert. It's actually got higher, among the highest rainfall figures in Africa. It's an agricultural economy. The Ethiopians are the most proud people that you can ever come across. They, if they, if we are to learn to not be colonially in hangover, we can go to Ethiopians. They can teach us how to be proud as Africans. But most of all, they have Ethiopian airlines a 100% government-owned airline that has become the most successful in Africa. Even during 2020, Ethiopian airlines were still profitable. They have managed to build the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam on the Nile River. And when the World Bank and the International Monetary Funds, whatever, were saying we won't fund the project, what did they do? They did that which we always say we should do, crowd financing. They went to villages and raised money for a $4 billion project from ordinary Ethiopians. I can go on and on, but the best way is catch that flight on Ethiopian Airlines. Get to Ethiopia, you will understand why to know Ethiopia is to love it. Sure, Victor, there's so many things we could talk about that we didn't get through. 
I wanted to talk to you about Nigeria. I wanted to talk to you about Angola. I wanted to talk to you about the Arab Spring, Cote d'Ivoire, DRC. But unfortunately, we don't have any much time left. Pick up the book. It's really an exciting read. Um, if you have questions, the book will answer most of your questions. I think it's, a, it's really a guide, a, an informative guide on understanding um, the African continent and uh, the many complexities that are out there as well. Victor, thank you so much for your time. It, really, it was really informative. Uh, and to everybody who's joined us uh, this afternoon, thank you so much for engaging. Um, Victor, thank you so much. Hey? Asante sana. Asante sana. In my language, I say Take care. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.